For the love of literature, how much land does one man need? By Leo Tolstoy. How much land does a man need? By Leo Tolstoy. Part one. A woman went to visit her younger sister in the country. She was married to a man who had a good job in the city. The younger was married to a peasant in a village. As the sister sat over tea, the older one began to talk about the advantages of city life. She told her sister how comfortably they lived, how well they dressed, what fine clothes her children wore. She talked about good things they ate and drank and how she often went to the theater, dances, and other entertainments. The younger sister was hurt by the older sister's words. In turn, she spoke badly about city life and spoke well about that of a peasant. I would not change my ways of life for yours, she said. We may live roughly, but at least we are free from worry. You live in a better style than we do, but though you often earn more than you need, you are very likely to lose all you have. It often happens that people who are wealthy one day have nothing to eat the next. Our way is safer, though a peasant's life is not a fat one. It is a long one. We shall never grow rich, but we shall always have enough to eat. Enough? Yes, said the older sister with a look on her face that said she did not agree. If you like to share with pigs and cows, what do you know of fine living or good manners? However hard your husband may work, you will die as you are living, poor, and your children the same. Well, what of that, answered the younger. Of course our work is rough and hard, but on the other hand, it is sure, and we are in charge of our own lives. But in the city, there are many things that could lead a person to do something bad. Today, all may be all right, but tomorrow... The devil may try to get your husband to play cards, drink too much wine, or go with other women. Then all will be lost. Don't such things happen often enough? Pahom, the younger sister's husband, had been listening. It's perfectly true, he thought. We peasants are busy from childhood working the earth. We have no time to let any silly thoughts settle in our heads. Our only trouble is that we haven't enough land. If I had plenty of land, I shouldn't fear the devil himself. The women finished their tea, talked a while about other things, and then cleared away the tea, things, and lay down to sleep. But the devil had been sitting behind Pahom. He had heard what he had said about not fearing the devil himself if he had plenty of land. <laughs> All right, thought the devil. We'll see who's stronger. I'll give you enough land, and by doing that, I will put you in my power. Part 2 Close to the village lived a lady who owned about 300 acres of land. She had always been on good terms with the peasants until she employed an old soldier to manage her farm. He took to charging fines to people whose animals came onto her land. However careful Pom tried to be, he was always paying fines. Now a cow of his found its way on to her land. Then a horse of his got among the lady's corn. Pahom paid up, but was unhappy about it. He would go home angry and be unkind to his family. All through that summer, Pahom had tried because had, had trouble because of this farm manager. He was even glad when the winter snow came and the cattle had to be kept indoors. Though he didn't like having to pay for hay, at least he was free from worry about them. In the winter, the news got about that the lady was going to sell her land, and that the keeper of the inn on the high road was talking to her about buying it. When the peasants heard this, they were very worried. If the innkeeper gets the land, they thought, he'll charge larger fines than the lady's farm manager. We all have to use that land sometimes. So the peasants went and asked the lady not to sell the land to the innkeeper, but to sell it to the commune so that they could all use it. They offered her a better price, which she accepted. Then the peasants tried to arrange for the community to buy the land. The commune met twice to discuss it, but could not agree on the matter. The devil caused them to argue with one another. 
So it was decided that the peasants should buy the land individually, each according to how much money they had. The lady agreed to this plan, as she had to the other. Soon after this, Palum heard that a neighbor of his was buying 50 acres. The lady had agreed to accept one half in cash and wait a year for the other half. Palum felt jealous. Look at that, he thought. The land is all being sold and I shall get none of it. So he spoke to his wife. Other people are buying land, he said. And we must also buy 20 acres or so. Life is becoming impossible. That farm manager is destroying us with his fines. So they put their heads together and considered how they could get enough money. They already had 100 rubles in cash. They sold everything that they could sell. They got one of their sons to take a job working on another farm and borrowed against his wages. Then they borrowed some money from a brother-in-law. They were able to put together half of the amount needed to buy 40 acres. Having done this, Pahum selected an area of land, some of it with trees, and went to the lady, came to an agreement, and then went down, went to town to sign the ownership documents. He paid half the price down and was to pay the other half within two years. So now Pahum had land of his own to farm. He borrowed seed and sowed on the land that he bought. The crop was a good one. And within a year, he had managed to pay off the money he owed to both the lady and to his brother-in-law. So he became a landowner. He plowed and sowed his land and made his own hay, cut his own trees, fed his cattle in his own grassy field. And when he went out to work his land or to look at his cattle or corn, his heart would fill with joy. The grass and flowers that grew there seemed to him unlike any that grew elsewhere. When he passed by that land before, it had appeared the same as any other land. Now it seemed quite different. Part 3 Pahum was very happy, and everything would have been fine if the neighboring peasants would have kept their animals off of his land. He asked them to do this very politely, but they still went on. The man who took care of the village cows did not watch them carefully, and they would get into his fields. Horses set free for the night would get among his corn. Pahum turned them out again and again and forgave their owners. He knew that the owners did not have their own land and that they did not mean to cause him harm. But at last, he lost his patience. I can't go on doing nothing, he thought. Otherwise, they'll destroy all I have. They must be taught a lesson. He complained to the district court and gave them one lesson and then another. Two or three of the peasants received, received fines. After a time, Pahum's neighbors began to feel angry towards him for this. Now and then, they let their cattle onto his land on purpose. One peasant even got into Pahum's wood one night and cut down five young trees for their bark. Pahum was passing through the woods one day and noticed something white. He came nearer and saw their trunks lying on the ground where the trees had stood. Pahum was very angry. If they had only cut one here and there, it would have been bad enough, thought Pahum. But whomever cut did this has cut down a whole group of trees. If I could only find out who did it, I would make him pay. He thought for a long time about who it could be. Finally, he decided it must be a neighbor by the name of Simon. He went to Simon's farmhouse to have a look around. He found nothing, but caused an angry scene. Then he felt more certain than ever that Simon had done it. He took Simon to the district court, but the judges found Simon not guilty. There was no evidence against him. Baum felt that he had been cheated and let his anger loose on the judges. You let thieves who give you money go free, he said. If you were honest men, you would not do this. So Pahum now argued with the judges as well as with his neighbors. People started to talk about burning his farm buildings. Though Pahum had more land, his place in the commune was much worse than before. About this time, 
word came to the village that many people were moving to new parts of the country. There's no need for me to leave my land, Pahum thought, but some of the other might leave the village and then there would be more room for us. I'll take over their land and have more. I would be happier. As it is, I don't have enough land to be comfortable. One day, as Pahum was sitting at home, a stranger passing through the village happened to call in. He was allowed to stay the night and was given dinner. Pahum asked him where he had come from. The stranger answered that he had came from another side of the Volga River, where he had been working. One word led to another, and the man went on to say that many people were settling in those parts. He told how some people from his village had moved there. They had joined the commune and had been given 25 acres per man. The land was so good, he said, that the wheat sown on it grew thick and tall as a horse. One man, he said, had brought nothing with him, and now he had six horses and two cows of his own. Pahom's heart burnt with desire. Why should I suffer in this small place if one can live so well elsewhere, he thought. I will sell my land and my farmhouse here, and with the money, I will start over again there and get everything new. In this crowded place, one is always having trouble, but I must first go and find out all about it myself. Toward summer, he got ready and started. He went down the Volga on a boat to Samara, then walked another 300 miles. At last, he reached the place. It was just as the stranger had said. The peasants had plenty of land. Every man was given 25 acres of communal land for his use, and anyone who had money could buy for around one ruble an acre as much land as he wanted. Having found out all he wished to know, Pahum returned home as autumn came on. He then began selling off his belongings. He sold his land at a profit, sold his farmhouse and all his cattle, and left the commune. He waited until the spring, and then started with his family for the new settlement. Part 4 As soon as Pahum and his family arrived at the settlement, he applied for admission into the commune of a large village. He gave presents to its leaders and was given the necessary documents to five shares of communal land for himself and his sons. That was a total of 125 acres. The shares were not all together, but in different fields. He could also use the communal pasture. Pahum bought cattle and put up the buildings he needed. One of the communal land alone, of the communal land alone, he now had three times as much as his former home. And it was good land for farming. He was 10 times better off than he had been. He had plenty of farmland and pasture and could keep as many cattle as he liked. At first, with all the activity of building and settling down, Pahum was pleased with it all. But then he got used to it. He began to think that even here, he didn't have enough land The first year, he sowed wheat on his 125 acres. He had a good crop and wanted to go on sowing wheat. But in that part of the country, the land could not be farmed every year. After being farmed for one or two years, it had to be left with nothing on it until the natural grasses had grown back. Some poor people who didn't want to farm off their land from the commune would rent it out to others. Those who were better off would rent such land for growing wheat but there was not enough for all. There were often arguments about it. Pahum rented some land for a year. He sowed much wheat and had a fine crop, but the land was far from the village, and he had to carry the wheat more than 10 miles. After a time, Pahum noticed that some farmers were living on separate land they had bought and were growing rich. If I were to buy some land, he thought, and live on it, it would be different then it would all be nice. The question of buying land came into his mind again and again. He went on in the same way for three years, renting land and sowing wheat. The seasons turned out well and the crops were good. He began to save money. 
He might have gone on living happily, but he grew tired of having to rent other people's land every year and having to fight to get it. Wherever there was good land to be had, all the peasants wanted it. Unless you acted at once, it would be gone. In the third year, he and another man rented a piece of land from some peasants. They had already plowed it up, ready for planting. When there was some kind of an argument, the peasants went to the law about it and took the land back. All the hard work they had done was lost. If it were my own land, Pahum thought, I should be independent. There would not be all these unpleasantness. So Pahum began looking out for land which he could buy. He came across a man who owned 1,300 acres, the man who had got into difficulties and was willing to sell it cheaply. Pahum bargained with the man, and at last they settled the price at 1,500 rubles, 1,000 rubles in cash, and the rest to be paid later. They had all but completed the sale when a passing stranger happened to stop at Pahum's farm to get some food for his horse. He drank tea with Pahum and they talked. The stranger told him that he was just returning from the distant land of the Bashkirs. He said that he had just bought 13,000 acres of land there for 1,000 rubles. Pahum questioned him further. All one needs to do is to make friends with the chief, he said. I gave away about 100 rubles worth of presents, as well as a case of tea. I also gave wine to those who would drink it. I got the land for less than eight kopecks an acre. It lies near a river. The whole area has never been farmed. He showed Pahum the ownership papers, and Pahum asked many more questions. There's more land there you could cover if you walked a year, the man said, and it all belongs to the Bashkirs. They are simple as sheep, and land can be got almost for nothing. There now, thought Pahum, with my 1,000 rubles, why should I get only 1,300 acres and have to pay more money later? If I take it out there, I can get more than 10 times as much land for the money. Part five. Pahum asked how to get to the place, and as soon as the stranger had left him, he prepared to go there himself. He left his wife to look after the farm and started on his journey, taking just one man with him. They stopped at a town on their way and bought a case of tea, some wine, and other presents, as the stranger had advised. On and on they went until they had gone more than 300 miles. On the seventh day, they came to the place where the Bashkirs lived. It was all just as the stranger had said. The people lived in tents by a river on the steeps. They did not grow crops or eat bread. Their cattle and horses were allowed to run free. The young horses were tied behind the tents, and their mothers came to them twice a day and were milked. From the milk, the women made cheese and a drink like beer called kumis. As far as the men were concerned, drinking kumis and tea, eating and playing on their pipes was all they cared about. They were all strong and happy, and all the summer long, they would never have thought of doing any work. They knew little of the outside world, and most of them did not even speak Russian, but they seemed friendly enough. As soon as they saw Pahum, they came out of their tents and gathered around their visitor. A, name, a man by the name of Ivan, who could speak Russian, was found. Bahum told them that he had come about some land, and the Bashkirs seemed very glad. They took Bahum and led him into one of the best tents, where they sat around him on a carpet. They gave him tea and kumis and had a sheep killed. They gave him some of its meat to eat. Bahum and his man... Pahum had his man take some presents out of the cart and give them to the Bashkirs. He also divided the tea amongst them. The Bashkirs were very happy. They talked a great deal among themselves, 
and then told Ivan to translate. They wish to tell you, said Ivan, that they like you and that it is our custom to do all we can to please a guest and to thank him for his gifts. You have given us presents. Now tell us which of these things we possess please you best, so that we may give them to you. What pleases me best here, answered Pahum, is your land. Our land has too many people, and the soil has been farmed for too long. But you have plenty of land, and it is good land. I never saw the like of it. I have been translated. The Bashkirs talked amongst themselves for a while. Pahum could not understand what they were saying, but saw that they seemed very happy and that they shouted and laughed. Then they were silent and looked at Pahum. They wish me to tell you, said Ivan, that in return for your presence, they will gladly give you as much land as you want. You have only to point it out with your hand, and it is yours. The Bashkirs talked again for a while, and there seemed to be some kind of disagreement among them. Pahum asked what they were talking about, and Ivan told them that their chief was away. Some of them thought that they did not act while he was away. Others thought there was no need to wait for his return. Part 6 While the Bashkirs were arguing, a man in a large fur cap appeared on the scene. They all became silent as soon as he entered. This is our chief said Ivan. Pahum immediately went and got his best presents and offered these to the chief. The chief accepted them and seated himself in the place of honor. The Bashkirs at once began telling him something. The chief listened for a while and then made a sign with his head for them to be silent. Addressing himself to Pahum, he said in Russian, well, let it be so. Choose whatever piece of land you like. We have plenty of it. How can I take as much as I like? thought Pahum. I must get ownership papers to make it secure or else they may say it's yours and afterwards may take it away again. Thank you for your kind words, he said. You have much land and I only want a little, but I would like to be sure which bit is mine. Could it not be measured in ownership papers given to me? Life and death are in God's hands. You good people give it to me, but your children might wish to take it away again. You are quite right, said the chief. That can be done quite easily. We have someone who can make up papers and will go to town with you and sign them at the government office. And what will be the price? Our price is always the same. One thousand rubles a day. Pahum did not understand. A day? What measure is this? How many acres would that be? We don't know how to reckon it out, said the chief. We sell it by the day. As much as you can go around on your feet in a day is yours, and the price is 1,000 rubles a day. Pahum was surprised. But in a day you can get around a large area of land, he said. The chief laughed. It'll all be yours, he said. But there is one condition. If you don't return on the same day to the spot from which you started, your money is lost. How am I to mark the way that I have gone? Why, we shall go to any spot you like and stay there. You must start from that spot and start walking, taking a spade with you. Wherever you think necessary, make a mark. At every turning, dig a hole and pile up the earth. Then afterwards, we will go around with a plow from hole to hole. You may mark off as large an area, a large an amount of land as you please. But before the sun sets, you must return to the place you started from. All the land you cover will be yours. Pahum was very happy with this. He decided to start the next day. They talked a while, and after drinking some more kumis and eating some more, they had tea again. Then the night came, and they gave Pahum a soft bed to sleep on, and the Bashkirs went to their own tents for the night. All promised to meet early in the next morning and ride out, in the appointed spot before the sun came up. Part 7. Pahum lay on the bed, but could not sleep. He kept thinking about the land. What a large area I'll mark off, he thought. I can easily walk 35 miles in a day. 
The days are long now, and if I walk 35 miles, what a lot of land there will be. I'll sell the poorer land, rent it to peasants. I'll pick out the best and farm it. I'll buy two ox teams and employ two men to work them. I'll grow crops on it on 150 acres, a pasture on the rest. Ahum lay thinking of his plans most of the night and only fell asleep an hour before it was time to wake up. Hardly were his eyes closed when he had a dream. He thought he was lying in that same tent and heard somebody laughing quietly outside. He wondered who it could be and got up and went out. There he saw the Bashkir chief sitting in front of the tent, holding his sides and rolling about with laughter. Going near to the chief, Bahum asked, What are you laughing at? But he saw that it was no longer the chief, but the stranger who had stopped at his house and told him about the Bashkir land. Just as Pahum was going to ask, Have you been here long? He saw that it was no longer that man, but the other stranger who had come up from the Volga to Pahum's old house. And he saw that it was neither him either, but the devil himself sitting there laughing. And before him on the ground lay a man with only trousers and a shirt on and no shoes. And Pahum dreamt. Then he looked more closely to see what sort of a man was lying there. And he saw the man was dead. And that it was himself. He woke up in horror. What things people sometimes dream, he thought. Looking around, he saw through the open door that the sun was about to come up. It's time to wake up, he thought. We ought to be starting. He got up, woke his man, who was sleeping in his cart, and asked him to get the horses ready. Then he went to call the Bashkirs. It's time to measure the land, he said. The Bashkirs, including this chief, got up, came together. They began drinking kimmas again and offered Pahum some tea. But he would not wait. If we're going to go, let us go. It's nearly time, said he. Part 8. The Bashkirs got ready and they all started. Some rode horses and some rode in carts. Pahum drove his own cart with his servant and took a spade with him. When they reached the steep, the sky was turning to red. They stopped at the top of a small hill and gathered in one spot. The chief came up to Pahum, stretched out his arm towards the plain. See, said he, all this, as far as your eye can reach, is ours. You may have any part of it you like. Pahom's eye shone. The land had never been farmed. It was almost completely flat. The soil was rich and black, and in some places the grass grew breast high. The chief took off his fur cap and placed it on the ground. This will be your mark, he said. Start from here and return here again. All the land you go around before the sun sets shall be yours. Pahum took out his money and put it in the cap. He took off his thick coat, remaining in his woolen vest. He put a little bag of bread into his vest pocket and tied a water bottle to his belt. Then he pulled up the tops of his boots, took the spade from his man, and stood ready to start. He thought for some moments which way he better go. Everywhere looked good. No matter, he decided, I'll go towards the rising sun. He turned his face to the east, stretched himself, and waited for the sun to appear above the horizon. I must lose no time, he thought, and it is easier to walk while it's still cold. As soon as the sun appeared, Pahum, carrying the spade over his shoulder, went down into the steep. He started walking neither slowly nor quickly. After having walked a mile, he stopped, dug a hole, and placed the pieces of earth one upon the other to make it easy to see. Then he went on. Now that his body had warmed up, he walked more quickly. After a while, he dug another hole. Pahum looked back. The hill could be clearly seen, with the people on it and the cartwheel shining in the sunlight. At a rough guess, Pahum thought he must now have walked three miles. It was growing warmer. He took off his vest and put it across his shoulders and then went on again. It had grown quite warm now. He looked at the sun. It was time to think of breakfast. 
The first part is done, but there are four parts in a day, and it is too soon yet to turn. But I'll take off my boots, he said. He sat now, took off his boots, tied them to his belt, and went on. It was easy walking now. I'll go on for another three miles, he thought, then turn left. The spot is so fine, it would be silly to lose it. The further one goes, the better the land seems. He went straight on for a while, and when he looked back, the hill was hard to see. The people in it looked like small black insects. He could just see something there shining in the sun. Ah, thought Pahum, I've gone far enough in this direction. It's time to turn. Besides, I'm very hot and very thirsty. He stopped, dug a large hole, and played, as before, placed the pieces of earth one upon the other to make it easy to see. Next, he untied his water bottle, had a drink, and then turned sharply to the left. He went on and on. The grass was high, and it was very hot. Pahum began to grow tired. He looked at the sun and saw that it was midday. Well, he thought I must have a rest. He sat down, ate some bread, and drank some water. But he did not lie down, thinking that if he did, he might fall asleep. After sitting a while, he went on again. At first, he walked easily. The food had strengthened him, but it had become terribly hot. He felt sleepy, but still he went on thinking. An hour to suffer, a lifetime to live. He went a long way in this direction also and was about to turn to the left again when he saw an area of wetland. It'd be silly to leave that out, he thought. So he went, went on, dug a hole on the other side of it before he turned the corner. Pahum looked towards the hill. The rising air caused by the heat made it look as if the hill was moving and the people on the hill could hardly be seen. Oh, thought Pahum. I've made the sides too long. I must make this one shorter. And he went along the third side, stepping forward. He looked in the sun. It was nearly halfway to the horizon. He had not yet done two miles of the third side of the square. He was still 10 miles from the goal. No, he thought. Although it will make my land an unusual shape, I must hurry back in a straight line. I might go too far. As it is, I have a great deal of land. So Pahum hurriedly dug a hole and turned toward the hill. Part 9 Pahum went straight towards the hill, but he now walked with difficulty. He was tired from the heat. His feet were cut and sore. He found it hard to walk. He wanted to rest, but it was impossible if he meant to get back before the sun went down. The sun waited for no man, and he was sinking lower and lower. Oh dear, he thought, if only I had not gone on trying for so much. What if I'm too late? He looked towards the hill and at the sun. He was still far from his goal, and the sun was already near the top. Pahum walked on and on. It was very hard walking, but he went quicker and quicker, and he pressed on but was still far from that place. He began running, threw away his vest, his boots, his water bottle, and his cap. He kept only the spade which we used to help him walk. What shall I do? He thought again. I have tried to take too much and I will lose everything. I can't get there before the sun sets. And this fear made him still more breathless. Poem went on running. His wet shirt and trousers stuck to him, and his mouth was dry. He was breathing heavily. His heart was beating loudly, and his legs were giving way, as if they didn't belong to him. Pahum became scared that he would die of the pressure. Though afraid of death, he could not stop. After having run all this way, they will call me a fool if I stop now, he thought. So he ran on and on. As he drew near, he heard the Bashkirs calling and shouting to him. Their cries made him try even harder. He gathered his last strength and ran on. The sun was close to the horizon and looked large and red as blood in the dying light. It was quite low, but he was also quite near the hill. 
Pahum could see the people on the hill waving their arms to hurry him. He could even see the fur cap on the ground with the money on it and the chief sitting on the ground holding his sides. And Pahum remembered the dream. There's plenty of land, he thought. But will God ever let me live on it? I've lost my life. I've lost my life. I shall never reach that spot. Pahum looked at the sun, which had reached the earth. One side of it had already disappeared. With all his remaining strength, he ran on, bending his body forward so that his legs could hardly follow fast enough to keep him from falling. Just as he reached the bottom of the hill, it suddenly grew dark. He looked up. The sun had already set. He gave a cry. Oh, my labor has been for nothing, he thought. He was about to step, but he heard the Bashkir still shouting. Then he remembered that to him, from below, the sun seemed to have set. They on the top of the hill could still see it. He took a long breath and ran up the hill. It was still light there. He reached the top and saw the cap. Before it sat the chief laughing and holding his sides. Again, Pahum remembered his dream and he gave out a cry and his legs gave way under him. He fell forward and reached the cap with his hands. Ah, that's a fine man, cried the chief. He's earned much land. Pahum's servant came running up and tried to raise him. He saw that blood was flowing from his mouth. Pahum was dead. The Bashkirs made sad noises and shook their heads to show how sorry they were. His servant picked up the spade and dug a grave long enough for Pahum to enter and buried him in it. Six feet from his head to his heels was all he needed. <laughs>